uh, there's a little problem with my Okay, let's start. What we're going to start today is we're going to start about research design. Now, please remember, for a lot of you, this beginning part is going to be quite confusing. We are really dealing with the introduction to research design. You're not expected to have a complete research design done as part of your proposal, just the high level and the beginning of a sound research proposal. But what you do have to do is you have to start make choices about what you're going to do. So in your proposal, for example, you have to state what methodology you're going to use and what method you're going to use. But you don't have to have your instrument if you're doing a questionnaire fully designed. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go, and you'll see there's quite a lot of slides, with a high level overview today of types of design. What we're going to focus on next week is going to be a little bit more in detail about some of those designs, the ones that are most appropriate, and around the instruments part, and making sure that your design meets the requirements of validity, reliability, and generalizability. Okay, so let's quickly, uh, quickly go through that. Those of you, uh, please, your design is going to be very, very difficult if you have not done assignment three. What assignment three is giving you, it is taking you through from your research problem and it's trying to take your main research question, your primary question, and breaking it down. Oops, that's a wild one. And it's trying to break it down into what should you do about this possible question in your research. Now doing assignment four or your literature review is really difficult as well without doing assignment three. Okay, so if you have done assignment three, you can do a very structured literature review and that thing will be sound if you've done a proper job of assignment three. And before you do your research design, you probably have to have a fairly good grasp of your literature, your structure, assignment three, and your literature review. So we are assuming that you have decided already, if you have done, if this is a research sub-question, if it is a literature question, if you are going to make that massive big assumption, it's an elephant in the room, or if it's going to lead to a limitation. You have made those decisions. And in assignment four, you have really dealt with the literature that supports your assumption, the literature that leads into your research sub-questions, and the literature questions that's going to be answered. So when you start with your research design, you know what the body of knowledge say about this sub-question, this more specific sub-question that you are going to answer. So you know what it's saying, and you also know exactly what you're trying to answer. Now, we're going to talk slightly about hypothesis. I'm not really going to focus on hypothesis at the moment. It's a form that you structure in, to, in order to answer a positivist type research question. So we're not going to go there now. We'll deal with that next week. You don't have to have Hypothesis, if you're doing more qualitative study, research sub-questions are sufficient. Okay? You may also want to write what's um, another form to say that, a research proposition. That's a for positivist form of a qualitative type question. So these things we'll deal with later. But we assume if you're here, you basically know what your structure is. Not where you are here now, but by the time that you're ready to start with your design. That means that before you hand in your research proposal, <coughs> even as far as you are with it, you should have a very, very good idea of what your research sub-questions are. Your um, literature review might still be patchy. You've got it structured. 
your liter your um, and your research sub questions must be clear and accepted by your supervisor. That was the rest of the proposal. Now, some of you have already found how messy research could be. I've seen some people in real trauma when they realize that the topic or the initial uh, title that they've handed in is no longer the title. There is absolutely nothing wrong with this. In your process to get clear about what research problem you're giving, you have to get to the real title. And you've scratched away and you now have the research problem and the title. In fact, because this is a cyclical process, you may end up changing your title yet again as you align and make sure that the golden thread goes through. Okay. But we assume that at the end, what you write down is a logical and systematic process. Now, the way to make sure that it's logical and systematic is to understand the logic, and that's a previous diagram that you want to prove. And then what you're doing is you're bringing effort, you investigate it critically, you're bringing evidence from the literature, and you're bringing empirical evidence that you've tested, and you're trying to answer the main research question. If you remember that um, U diagram, you will s remember that what we said about the research design, that it's merely the way or the, merely the recipe that you are going to follow to get the real data of the real world that will form the empirical part of proving it. You're really trying to review and synthesize knowledge. We've really looked at that in chapter two or assignment four. You want to investigate a problem, that was assignment one. You want to generate new knowledge, that was also in assignment one. You want to construct something new, especially at doctorate level, assignment one. And you want to explain new phenomena, assignment one. So a lot of the purpose that what you're doing is in assignment one. And it may not be in your first attempt of assignment one, but it certainly should be in the one that your supervisor signs off on and agree that this is acceptable. Now the big trick here is that people very often you have a question, but you're not coherent. You're all over the place. The way that you seek to answer this question is not in line with the questions that you're asking. Remember, as part of assignment three, we want you to look at this specific question and say, no, is it a qualitative one, is it a quantitative one? Where's the data? Where's the literature? So you've already grappled with that. But you want to have a research design that is coherent and follows logically. And this roadmap, um, who of you know those two people? The, the, um, Delia Smith and Keith Floyd. They are both artists of food. Delia Flo Smith will go around and she'll tell you. They both have television shows. They had television shows. She will tell you, you start here. You weigh, measure, and if you follow the steps that I give you exactly, you will have a perfect cake, but perfect this way. Keith Floyd said, you know what? You want this kind of taste? Add a little bit of this. Add a little bit of that. Stir it and work out what you want to add more. And you'll have a fabulous meal. Different ways to do that. So what we really want to know, we want a much clearer picture. A roadmap is your high level, add a little bit, look a little bit at this. It's still acceptable in your proposal phase. But when you put your research design together for your final document, you want to have much clearer directions so that somebody else can follow what you've done and repeat that study. What's interesting to know is that Delia Smith has got a heck of a lot of money and Keith Floyd died from alcohol overindulgence. <laughs> okay, so you probably want to get your degree. So just guess which one would be the most appropriate route for you to follow. Um, alcohol abuse is an option at some points during your study. I'm certain you will experience that need, <laughs> but <laughs> let's not talk about that now. Okay. So you want to really, really talk clear objectives. 
If you've done assignment three, you know what your objectives, your empirical objectives. It's to answer the research sub-questions and to answer the overall research question, the driving research question. Those are your objectives. You want to know your sources of data. You've probably already engaged with it. Now, for some of you, when you came to speak we, or be spoken to, what we really talked is we started scratching and saying, do you know where you're going to get the data? Because if you have a problem with the kind of data you're going to get, you may have to change your research questions because you can't answer that data. Research is about the art of the possible. So you can phrase beautiful research questions, but if you can't answer them, there's no point in it. That must either become a limitation or you must scope it outside of your work or you must make an assumption. So you want to be able, at this point, to say exactly where your data is going to be. Is it going to be in people? Is it going to be secondary data? And if it's in people, in what people? I mean, one of the discussions we had today is about trying to look at whether you're, trying, you're getting the, op, the, what is the images of South Africa as a destination, a tourist destination. Are you going to pick it up when tourists arrive or when tourists leave? By the time that they leave, they've got other ideas added onto it. They don't have the image that made the choice to come to South Africa, do they? So your data is actually the people at the point before they've been here. So to get the good kind of information, you have to ask people when they arrive in this country. And if it, you really understand what airports are about, you'll know that people that get off a long flight don't want to answer questions. That is certainly not what they want to do. They want to get away, they want to sit down, they want to have a peaceful time or want to sleep or do something. So it's going to be difficult to access that data. So your, your ability to get that data, your ability to understand what that data must be clear even when you're putting your proposal together. You must also know how you're going to collect the data. Okay. Are you going to use a questionnaire? Are you going to use Delphi? Are you going to use structured interviews? What are you going to do? Are you going to basically do detailed discussions? Or in the case of, of places where you're not really talking to people, are you going to take measurements? Are you going to take data from from companies' business reports or the um, year re annual reports, what are you going to do? How are you going to collect it? And most importantly, how are you going to analyze it? It's really distressingly common to find students at the end of their research saying, I've got this data, now what do I do with it? Can I Bec make an appointment with a statistician? Can, yeah, <laughs> can I make it? Because now this is what I have. And then it's, this is what you have. What questions can you answer? Because you may not be able to answer the questions that you wanted to answer if you didn't work out how you're going to analyze it from the beginning. So you, and that analyze, please, do not tell me I'm going to use a pink pencil or a green pen. So I don't really care if you're going to use SPSS. You may use it, as a, but I want to know if you're going to do a factor analysis. I know what, if you're going to do correlations. I want to know what you're going to do. SPSS is the tool. Pink pen, green pencil, something around that. Atlas TI is a tool. Are you going to do content analysis? Are you going to do discourse analysis? How are you going to analyze it? Yes, you've got to put those tools in, but it's very important to say how you're going to analyze it. Very important, the ethical issues. You must know about that in your research design because it really influences it. You must know what constraints you're going to do. Now, please, there's a serious difference between a constraint and a limitation. A constraint is, I want to finish this within a year. A limitation is, Oops, because I ha I'm going to finish it in two years, I'm not going to be able to answer these questions. Or I'm not going to be able to have enough data to do a full 
um, inferential analysis about it. So you want to actually know that you can do this. Because that's what you're trying to give in a proposal. You're trying to tell the audience it's a problem. It's a real problem. I've proven it. I know what people say about this problem. I know what I can do to collect the data and pull it together. So tell me to go ahead because I know exactly what I'm going to do. Maybe not all the finer detail, but I know that. And most of all, you have to demonstrate that you have thought about this. Now, one of the most problem areas that happens is when people do, say, for example, mixed method um, research, they make a single research design. It's not a single design. Every design has a specific element that focuses on one part of your design. So in your design, you may use diff different areas. Say, for example, you want to find out what factors influence a certain behavior. So the first thing you do is you read what the literature say. Then you do a small, in-depth survey where you talk to a few people about it. Then you do a large-scale survey. Is the population the same? Is the sampling plan the same? So you can certainly not give me one group together design. And that's probably one of the most difficult things. You look at this design and you can't work out what somebody's doing. So if you're going to think about it very logically, tell us in what order you're going to do it. Tell us how you're going to do. Use subparagraphs. Maybe you do a diagram. I'm going to do this. Parallel, I'm going to do this and this. And then I'm going to do that. And then describe each of those blocks. So we must know that you've thought about it and that you're comfortable. A research design, this is one definition. Okay. One of the big tricks about writing your research proposal or your document at the end is where you start introducing your references. In chapter one, you will be introducing references predominantly around the research problem and substantiating that problem. In chapter two, the bulk of your references, your literature is going to go in. In chapter three, sometimes you put a little bit about your design. But in chapter three is where you introduce your references about the research methodology, the research design. No matter what I tell you, you're going to have to read very deeply. We've recommended the book by Saunders. There are many other books. Okay, Each of them use different terminology. If you're doing case study research, you certainly have to include Yin. You certainly have to include Eisenhardt. So one textbook is not just not going to be enough. So there's two reasons why you introduce your references here. The one is to tell people what terminology you're going to use. Because about research design, there are so many definitions. Do I call it a a paradigm? Do I call it epistemology? What do I call it? I'm working from this book, so I'm using these terms. You're putting people on your page. You also have to use different text that is going to talk about the detail of your design. After chapter three, no new references may enter your document. Okay, anything else? Anything else has to come from previous in <coughs> I'm sorry, I don't want to blast your ears out when you listen to the. <coughs> Anything else have to be introduced earlier. So when you start using different uh, references, one of the points that people have got real issues with is when you don't have any literature on the body of knowledge that you're working on, but you have about 20 references on research methodology. You should have references about research methodology, but that should be put into your research methodology chapter. 
and it's to explain to us what forms you're using and it's and to de not defend but to give us a serious indication of what you're going to do in the detail. So you need to consult detailed research methodology books. Your supervisor will be able to guide you around what books they believe are appropriate for this research. There's no ways that I can guide you. I can give you what I think, but it may not be appropriate in your field of study. So you use the research methodology books that is common in your area. If you don't have one, probably the book by Saunders about research for business students is a very robust, solid book. But you find your own things around that. So you have strategic choices, which deals with the philosophy the, about the epistemology, things like that. Then you make strategic or uh, tactical choices around what methodology you're going to follow. And after that, you make operational choices. So if you start looking at probably your strategic choice is true for your whole, everything in your research. It may even be that your tactical choice is true for all of your research. But your operational choices may be different and may be more than one. In Saunders, and you don't have to read this thing because it's not that clear, but in Saunders, they describe the research design as an onion. Now, I think that looks like an egg. But they say it's an onion. So I've gone around calling the research egg and confusing the heck out of my students. That is a research onion. And what you do is while you're making these choices, you start and you peel away the layers. You cannot make a choice about what data collection you're going to do unless you've done the outside layer of the choice, which is talking around your philosophy totally outside layer and what they call a philosophy and you probably can't see it is positivism, realism, interpretivism or pragmatism. We haven't really talked about pragmatism. It is not always a happy choice for some researchers. I believe in it but those are your um, strategic choices, or your um, philosophy choices. After you've made that you are going to make some choices around what approach you are going to follow. Are you going to follow an inductive approach or are you following a deductive approach or combinations thereof? We haven't spoken about it and for most of you that may not be an issue. If that is an issue that your supervisor feels that you have to deal with, Google it, read about it. The next deductive is really this is true, I can therefore deduce that the following thing is true. Inductive is evidence, 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 therefore I can prove that that is true. That's the real difference there. After you've done those outer layers, and that you just make a choice. You don't say, I defend my positivist choice. You just have to say, this research is positivist and I'm going to follow an inductive approach. End of the matter. If you're at a doctoral level, you may debate a little bit more about it. Now you're going to do the next layer. And your next layer of choice deals with your methodology. Let's go on, we'll get to it back again. So the strategic choices at the highest level is around how are you going to go about looking at the knowledge that you're generating and how are you going to build that knowledge. So you're starting your basic philosophical read, uh, beliefs, your epistemology, or your paradigm. All of these words are used by different authors to describe the same type of thing. So the words you use must be in line with your predominant or your main reference of your literature review, of your research design that you are using. The next thing is your tactical choices. You've now gone through the outside dark rings and you're making tactical decisions. And your decisions is about the approaches that you're going to adopt to get evidence, the approaches that you're going to put together for understanding this. 
that we've got it. So the first one is research pathology. Your next choice, and I've got it now slightly confused, so let me just get down to it. To my egg again. Ah, oh, sorry. Your next level is where you make a decision if you're going to follow mono method. In other words, your methodolo methodological choice is qualitative. All of it is qualitative. If you're going to look at mono method quantitative, if you're going to look at multi-method qualitative, we're going to talk about that now. If we're talking about multitative quantitative qualitative or mixed method a simple form of a difficult form you have to make that choice that choice is determined by the research sub questions that you've chosen if that sub question if every single one of them are quantitative obviously you are going to follow a predominantly quantitative choice you may use more than one method so you may use a large-scale survey and some um, detailed research that is on secondary data. What, say, for example, you want to look at some published statistics, but it's, um, that is then a multi-method quantitative. Or you might find all of them are qualitative and the same thing happens. Okay. So we'll, we'll talk about that. The next step that's part of your tactical decision is how are you going to about acquiring those data? And it's really bespoken, um, it's really called your methodological choice. Okay. Am I going to use experiments? Am I going to use design? And we're going to spend quite a lot of time talking about those so that you can make a methodological choice. What methodology? methodology are you going to use or are you going to use more than one then we're going to make decisions around the inner layer so we'll get to that your qualitative or quantitative decision as I said is determined by the question now of course the questions that you have decided to answer may be determined by what's acceptable in your field of study what's comfortable for you and your supervisor and it should be comfortable to you. You should feel instinctively happy about this choice because if you're doing, you're trying to force your brain to work in a qualitative mode when you are a quantitative person, you are not playing to your strengths. You're adding extra hurdles into your process of getting your degree and that's not very clever. When you become a supervisor, you're going to be expected to be comfortable in most areas. But until that, you follow the process that's comfortable for you, that you feel instinctively happy about, especially at the master's level. Quantitative, as we, we talk about the epistemology and the um, positivist thing, more and more and more. So I think you're quite happy with that, are you? I see yawns here. Now, anybody yawning at me, I'm going to yawn back at. I am really, <laughs> my mind has gone through loops today. I'm trying to follow every one of you. S not everyone, but most of you. So I've gone through my loops. So any yawning and I will yawn, or you will go and answer my question. So are you all comfortable about the outside layer, about what is positivist, about what is interpretivist? Are you comfortable about that? Do you remember that? Very first presentation. If you look at it positivist, you believe this is the reality. Facts are facts. There's no context. If I jump down from there to there, there is something called force of gravity. If I jump from there to there, I'm going to be flat. Absolute. On the other side, Qualitative uh, um, interpretivists say reality is only there because a person experiences it. There's no absolute. It's only determined by how people interpret that. And in the middle, the realism, remember that thing, really say it's a little bit of that and a little bit of this. Are you comfortable with that concept? Remember them. Okay. 
The next one, are you comfortable about what qualitative and quantitative is? Anybody not comfortable about it? Please talk now. We want to talk about that. The, there are different definitions that Pete did, but fundamentally the difference is if I do quantitative research, I stand away from my reality and I put a little screen in front of my reality and I sample little bits of information that I can utilize statistics to answer my questions. So I design a survey, I design various instruments to collect specific data, I pull that data together, I analyze it. I've got answers on this, answers on that, and I start working out. Qualitative is different, you stand there, you say, oops, this is reality. Let me enter the reality, and then I get my data. You can quantify your data, so you go into this reality, and you pop out quantify data. At the end, you get data at the top that you work with. The difference is, how are you going to get that data? Are you get it by standing away and getting information? Or are you going to enter the messy bit and work around that? Now, a lot of people believe that qualitative research is an easy way out. It's not. When you're in the reality, then it's really messy. Okay? You can do a lot of things to help you go through the reality and develop instruments. But qualitative is something that you really have to engage. And sometimes you have an embarrassment of data. It's not that you have a few bits of data, you have too much data. That choice, how about what did you feel comfortable with in your own heart? Did you feel comfortable about looking there and sampling data? Is that your skill? Or did you feel comfortable about really knowing what's happening in there? That is probably going to tell you whether you're leaning towards a qualitative or quantitative approach. If you feel that both of them have got benefits, but they both have problems as well, you're probably going to sit in the middle. You're going to use a variation or a number of these. Okay. So, if you're quantitative, you basically say that I live here and I'm saying the reality is outside of myself, I can measure it. If you're fully qualitative, you're basically saying reality is about how I experience it. The knowledge is about how I experience it. Is it clear enough? So, so, still as clear as mud. <laughs> okay. yeah. uh, when I was looking at the questions, mm -hmm. there was a time when I was trying to say, can I go according to the what or the how and, and that? Yeah. But I realized later on that there's also the what that has to answer, that has to be quantity, and there's also the what that has to be quality. Yes. But then it became difficult there to say, where Which do one? I cut the line? Th then you've got to say that it's both, it can be, and we're going to talk about that now. Mm. So there are some methodological choices that make us comfortable with answering both kinds of questions. Mm. And there are some questions that you want to look at from a qualitative view and from a quantitative view to make sure that your answer is reliable, that I get the same answer from both sides. And that just makes your case stronger. So there, there are different ones. <coughs> Paradigm, we've spoken about these over and over, the philosophy, the theoretical framework, and all I'm doing now is I'm bombarding you with different ways to say the same thing. Every textbook has a different way. Follow your textbook. Okay? But you want to have a con uh, basically a coherent approach that you're going to do your design. <coughs> I'm talking to people doing research on a wide range of topics. There's not one of you, or there's sometimes there's about two of you that approximately work in the same area. In most cases, you're working on a variety of different problems, wide range of problems. So there is no single answer for you. I can only make you aware so that you can make your own choices under the guidance of your supervisor. If you're positivist, meaning I can prove it, 
you are typically going to deal with a, pos with a quantitative, objective, scientific, and please, when, when I really throw tantrums if people say, you've got to do scientific research, and what they mean is you've got to do quantitative research. <laughs> the science in qualitative research is in the process, the scientificness. Okay. So experiment, traditionalist, and interpretivist is on the other side. Now, as you probably realized, there's nothing that academics enjoy more than disagreeing. That's why we debate topics, that's why we write academic papers, that's why we all build up different knowledge. If we all agreed that we one set of knowledge and it's not going to move, is it? So academics enjoy disagreeing. And if you have somebody with a totally positive view and a po positivist view and a totally interpretivist view, they are probably going to like, disagree like anything. Your supervisor is somewhere on this continuum. And that means that the comfort that you feel and the comfort that your supervisor feel will be negotiated. And you've got to go through that process. Okay. It's, it's unfortunately one of the issues that is dealt with in your supervisory student relationship. So no matter where you are, that is a negotiated position. You have to know where you are comfortable with and your supervisor have to know where they're comfortable with and you negotiate around that. Okay, let's look at the multiple methods. This is just another form and this is also, you'll see Saunders et al. featuring heavily here. It's a really robust book. When you make your methodology choice on the left, very easy, qualitative, quantitative. One method, I am going to do a large-scale survey, quantitative. I am going to do a single ethnographic study, qualitative. End of question. Very easy. Then you write a single bit about your design. But on the other side, you're probably going to use more than one method. You can, on the left, say, I'm going to do more than one method of collecting data. Method talks about collecting data in a quantitative way. Or I'm going to use more than one method in a qualitative way. Or you can stand totally and you can say, okay, and if you're on this side of it, you're probably looking at a realism kind of perspective. I'm going to use more than one method, mixed methods, or I'm going to use mixed model of different models that I'm looking at or mixed methods that I'm looking at. And if you've got different methods, it could be a really simple one that I'm saying, I'm going to follow mixed methods here. And I'm going to do it very simple. I'm either going to do them one or two in parallel, but they're not too heavily integrated, or I'm going to do them one after another, not too heavily integrated. Or you can make it really difficult for yourself. At a doctoral level, sometimes people work into that complex area. If you're there, you've got to be really, really sure that you want to be there because it just makes your life that little bit more difficult. It also, of course, if you follow the more difficult route, it makes people more convinced that you have contributed at the methodological level. So if you really want to contribute there, play there, but make an informed decision. Recap, empirical research. So what we're going to talk about here is about getting your primary evidence together so that you can answer your questions. You can understand what you're studying. That evidence could be qualitative evidence or quantitative evidence. And it's slightly different from theoretical research. If you want to do theoretical research, you're saying, okay, let me read about this, let me read about this, let me think deep thoughts. I bring these things together and I come up with a new theory. That is not easy to do. And building and proving that is very, very difficult. But that is the wonderful world where people really start pushing the boundaries forward significantly. But you're probably not going to be in there. If you are, talk again. 
but I'm going to scare everybody else off if I'm talking about that. Okay? It depends where you're going to get your evidence. It depends. Have you got statistical skills or can you acquire it? If you have statistical skills, if you're good at that, if you can acquire it, then probably doing straightforward quantitative research is going to be your safest, soundest choice. If you don't have it, and you can deal with people, but if you start doing qualitative research, unless you're really going to evaluate things that have been captured, data that you're going to do solid myth, um, content analysis, etc., on, you're going to have to deal with people. If you're not comfortable with dealing with people, with asking them questions, then it's going to be difficult for you as well. And those difficulties is something that you have to be very aware of. I'm perfectly happy to chat to people, to ask them questions, to approach strange people and ask deep and personal questions. That's okay for me. Then I can do that form of research. Or I'm really, 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 really happy to stand here and feed things into the statistical and do deep and significant statistical analysis and talk in numbers and coefficients, then that's a choice for me. If you're in the middle, you've got to look at that. Okay? Your tactical decisions is your next layer. If you've made those decisions, those middle decisions, then you've got to start making your tactic, your strategic decisions, then you make those. And we've been speaking about those. So methodology is about the procedural framework that you followed. I'm doing case study research. Methods is about the way that you're going to collect your data. So I'm doing case study research, but I'm going to do archival type analysis or I'm going to actually use, in my case study, a survey. Or I'm going to use um, conversations. Or I'm going to use a focus group, something like that. Okay. Positivist, let's talk about that. Sometimes experiment. Experimental design is what happens in the hard sciences. It sometimes happens in management science. But what makes experimental design important is that you are trying to take away every external factor. If one's saying, what's the relationship or why <coughs> are the, is the inefficiencies at processing new enrollments, and you say you want to study that, if you want to do exper experiments, you're going to take everything out of it and you're going to run an experiment that you ha take the university out of context, the student out of context, and you don't understand the context. Okay? Experiment, mostly positivist. Archival research, that's there. It's absolutely there. Survey tend to be, but case studies can also work here. So that is a case study that you then analyze. And typically, you're looking at embedded case studies and things like that. Interpretivist. Case studies again features ethnography, I'm going to talk about that now, action research, grounded theory, narrative inquiry, or participatory inquiry of observations. Who of you recognize these terms? Who of you don't yet recognize these terms? You don't have to know all of them. You have to be able to make a choice, an informed choice. At a doctoral level, you have to be comfortable enough to be solid about the other choices as well and understand them. At a master's level, you make a choice. That's it. And Google is your best friend. And Google is your best friend, even if you have to read Wikipedia. Just do it under a blanket in the dark so that nobody knows it's all safe. Okay. So, we have now gone through that layer. And we, with the inside too little of the, of the oniony egg or the eggy onion, okay? <laughs> we are now going to look whether we're going to do cross-sectional research or we're going to do longitudinal research. And then we're going to say exactly how are we going to scratch this data out of people? What's the instruments that we're going to use? 
So we're going here. Next step, time horizon. Am I going to do a study that looks at something in this time? I'm doing a case study and I'm comparing different cases to each other at a single time. I'm doing a survey and I'm looking at it. Or am I going to do longitudinal research? So I'm looking at how this changed over time. So I have samples at various time intervals. Now, if you're trying to get a degree, especially a shorter, the master's degree, it's very difficult to collect data over time horizons. So if you want to do longitudinal research, for example, the effect of prices, of stock exchange prices with something else that varies over time, you are going to start looking at secondary data because you can't collect them, you don't have the time to look at it. And the doctoral research, you may have something around it, but you don't want to have a time horizon of more than two years to collect your data because then you really, really make it very difficult for you to complete your doctoral study. And, but overall, when you become a professor, you're going to have a number of different master's students that may do similar research over time, and you build up a repository of research that has a time horizon. So cross-sectional, evidence collected on more than one case at a single point in time. Okay? Data can be qualitative or quantitative, and you want to look at the correlations at how these things happen inter internally. Longitudinal is used to describe change. The moment the word change happens to be in your problem, in your question, you are probably going to look at longitudinal research. So from a practical way, look at it immediately, where you're sitting now, and try and work out if you are going to be able to collect the evidence over the time, or if that evidence is captured somewhere that you can collect it, that you can get it together. Okay. <coughs> Probably in longitudinal research, if I'm going to say, and I want to study, I'm at the Productivity Institute, I want to study over time the effect of a major training intervention that I've had. So I start off and I train a hundred companies. Okay. And I hope they're really, really going to survive. A year later, 80 of them survived. A year later, 60 of them survived. So if you start off with a very, very small number, you may end up having nothing to study down the line. So you're losing cases and attrition through the time. So if we want to see how long is it going to happen and am I going to lose it? Your last, and this is one of your, your, your tactical decisions around that. And your tactical decisions are now exactly what tools I'm going to use. Okay. What are you going to do? There are tactics. This is the way that you're going to collect the data. So within a case study, you can look at the case of Johannesburg and you can do massive quantitative large-scale survey. Or you can look at this case and you do deep, in-depth analysis, both ways. But your tactics could be to do lab experiments. It could be to do field experiments. We're going to talk about these now. It could be participant observer. Okay? A participant observer, you're both part of the work on the ongoing things that you study, but you're also the researcher that observe. So you've got two places that you're looking at this thing from, and bias might be an issue. Large-scale survey, in-depth survey, case studies. Remember, case study and case study research is not exactly the same thing. The word case study, or the two words case study, could be used to talk about a form of methodology or also about a method. So those two are sometimes used interchangeably and then people get confused. Are you talking about the case as a method or are you talking about case study research? Google it or get your book. Okay. You can also use forecasting. You can also use futures research simulation, 
You can use game or role playing, you can use focus groups, you can use ethnography, you can do scenario research. So if we put that together, let's talk about the one by one. Because here is where you really have to make your choices. The first layer, so basically your choices is strategically, which side am I? Then we're looking at it tactically, what methodology I'm going to follow. And now you're starting to look at, at operational level. Longitudinal and exactly what I'm going to use. So if you have lab experiments, see your old-fashioned scientist, white coat, quite mad. Take it out of context. I look at it in isolation. That you can use if you're positivist. It's modeled on the um, life sciences and physical. It's limited application to management. So you can, for example, set up studies in human resource that you take people outside and you simulate a thing. And you want to say, how do people make decisions? So you take the person out, you put them in a little room, you fill it in tray with a lot of jobs, you put them down, and through a window, a few people watch them and say, exactly how does he make decisions? It's a lab experiment, very close to one. Field and it's controlled environment, it's very easy to replicate. Every time you take a person, you put a person in front of that tray of documents, it's exactly the same. You can see what's the differences in the people. There's nothing else that's different. So it's easy to replicate. A lot of ethical issues, though. Your, your ethical issues could be an issue. Field experiment, who of you don't know about the Hawthorne experiment? People were trying to look whether the difference of light would influence how productive people eat will be, and then what they found out, although this has later now been disproved or questions about it, that in fact, if you just fiddle with the light level, people are more productive because they think you, you care about them. You, you're paying attention. It's as simple as that. What form of attention are you paying? So this is a field experiment. It's happening in a live environment. You are changing things, you're still experimenting, but you're observing it in real life. Okay. There's limits to what type of question because you're typically interfering with something. So you have to get permission to interfere by asking them or to observe something. It's not completely positivist because you can't totally take it out of its context. Context is a bit important. And the results may have more qualitative elements in, in how you interpret it. Participant observer, the researcher join a team, and he is part of this team, he's participating, but at the same time, he's observing. So he's got two roles in there. Part of the process, observing. Some of you are going to do your research in the companies where you work. So you want to look at things that affect employee engagement. You are employee. You're engaged. There's certain way that you experience the situation that you can never be an outside person putting you and saying, how is employees engaged? Because you're part of it. Okay. But you've got two roles. So look at that very carefully. Um, it's very difficult to do that. You've got to be observing things while the time. You've got to record it. There's a lot of things around that. But you, that can be done. Large-scale survey, in my mind, the easiest form to do as long as you can commit statistics and you can design a survey. We're going to talk about that and you can get statistical support in that around your survey design. We're just going to talk about next week about the instruments itself. And you want to find out what's opinion. You can ask various scales. How do you rate it out of 10? You can ask them out of the following one, two, three, which one do you choose? There's different ways, but you're trying to do quantitative work. Strictly positivist logic. You don't want to deal with interpreting 10,000 responses and looking at the qualitative data. Strictly positivist. In-depth surveys, small sample size. 
when you do large scale surveys, what you need to do is you need to look at sampling. You need to look at the probabilistic sampling that you're doing. Uh, there's a lot more from the design point that you've got to take into account. In-depth survey, small sample, not one or two, it's a little bit more. Structured interviews where you have topics that you cover or in unstructured interviews where you sit with a person and t ask him, tell me about your experience as a mature student. Record it and then do content analysis. So I don't interfere in your correction. What's important for me is what you talk about first, how you talk about it, what don't you talk about. So I'm not going to interfere in your recollection at all. I have a totally open interview. I might be probing every now and again to make sure that I've understand something, understood something, but I'm not going to have a very structured way that I'm going to ask it. Um, unstructured interviews, you probably have a lot of trouble because you have um, a lot of issues ethically because you have to record that. With an unstructured interview, making notes, you don't record everything. So you want, may want to type it, or you may do, even sometimes want to videotype it. And I can tell you being videotaped is not a pleasant experience, especially when you see yourself afterwards. You get a little bit of a trauma. <laughs> but so people don't want to be taped. They're not comfortable about being taped. What if I say something wrong? What if somebody captures something that I say that they can use against me? What if I look like an idiot? So people tend to be a little bit reluctant about that and your ethical clearance and your actual agreement of people to be recorded and that information used is the issue. If you're wanting to assure a person's anonymity, it also becomes the issue because you want to record the detail, but you don't want anybody access to that detail so that they can use it against somebody. You want to talk to in depth interviews with uh, some of the workforce and you ask him, what do you really think of your boss? Because you're trying to, you're trying to analyze, this is what you study, you've got permission, the guy says okay, but if the information about what I think about my boss gets out, I mean if you're in a political career fairly high up in the ANC, I think that's a really, really dangerous <laughs> thing to do and you can probably see what's the consequences if, if it's found out what you think about your boss. So the whole issue about anonymity, things become a little bit more difficult there. Your analysis of your transcripts can be positivist. You're actually saying, let me see what they said. Let me count what they spoke about. I've got this list. Did they speak about this? Yes. And if you start looking at your exam paper, this is it. It's a structured interview. You can write, we give you a structure, you write, we have a positivist interpretation scheme. That's my memo. Have you said this? One. Have you said this? Two. That's exactly what it's about. You can look at it from that perspective, or you can be interpretivist. You can interpret, you can experience, you can see what's going there. There's a variety that you can do there. Case studies. This is now if you want to understand something in depth. You want to know what happens in government departments. But you're certainly not going to look at how many hundreds of government, at say or per, or at a local government level, you're not going to look at those hundred and sample them randomly and go into depth according to um, a um, totally random sampling process you can do statistics. So you go around there and say, okay, let's think about it. I think if I want to talk about things around the manufacturing industry, if I look at Gauteng, that's a good case. So what I'm doing there is I am choosing a purposive case. I'm looking at a case purposively. I'm saying this one will suit my purposes. Or I say, Listen, if I want to know about a department into trouble, I've got a choice. Is it going to be the Ministry 
of policing and defense at the moment, or is it going to be communication? One of those. Those are compelling cases. You want to look at companies of departments in trouble or ministries in trouble, those two are in trouble. So I want to know about trouble. Looking at either of them will show me what kind of troubles have happened. That's a compelling case. So anything that could have gone bad has happened there. If I study it, I will find the bad things. So I'm not looking at good cases to find the bad things. I'm finding it something really, truly bad. So I will find the bad things there. So you really have to do the, you can have unique situations. So what are you looking at? You're looking at an in-depth narrative description, what is really happening there. You can also do some quantitative, but you can use a variety of methods. You can look at documents. You can, observation could be purely quantitative. I'm gonna say, I mean, I listen to what these guys say about equality between managers, leaders, and the workforce. But I'm going to do my favorite observation method. It's proven, not statistically, but I think I can be done if you want to do. I'm going to do some observations. Here I put my instrument. I'm going to work, walk into the toilets used at every level. And I'm going to observe what toilet paper is used. If it's the same toilet paper straight through, I will believe that they treat people equally. What's the chance of finding the same toilet paper? <laughs> so I've got a very positivist approach. I'm sampling something. I'm not talking to people about how e they treat it equally. I'm going to go in there. I'm going to sample. Uh, for example, and then I can extend it. I can look at the toilet paper. I can look where they eat. And if they, I can look where they can close their office doors. Certain things about equality. And these things that I've defended in my instrument design, I go and observe that. So I can observe quantitatively or qualitative. What do I see? You tell me this, let me go see what I see. Okay. Action research, it's increasingly popular. And I, let me see how this works. I've designed this. Let me now go and implement it and observe it at different times. It allows for the fact that you're not the only th one that reviews that. As the term go by, you can review it with somebody else. That's participatory action research. And it incorporates the feedback throughout the process. In case study research, you are not involved in this process. You may have a participative observe it role, but you're not actually doing or changing something to, in order to study that. And in action research, you're doing or changing something in order to study that. But you also have very formal, rigorous reviews. So doing this, let's stand back and see what's happening. Change it a little bit, observe it, change it a little bit, get feedback there and change it. Okay, so you're really looking at intervention into a system or si situation and whether it works. It's very demanding, it's very rewarding because you actually see something change. But it's also really difficult to get permission to do that. Okay. You very seldom get opportunity that you say, I have this wonderful idea. Now let me find a government department that wants to say, if I follow this, if I do this, it has an effect. You think I'm going to get permission? Let me find a commercial company. But you find situations and where you can do action research, it is really rewarding. But there are ethical issues around. You can't do action research on people if other alternatives are up. If you're affecting them in the long term, there's a whole lot of ethical issues in there. Forecasting. Forecasting is the delight of the people that are really strong quantitative. Although if you say forecasting, you're thinking of this old lady with the scraggly hair looking at a crystal ball. <laughs> that can be done, but probably your forecasting in this case is quantitative. Although you can do forecasting based on qualitative, that's not called forecasting. 
that's called something else. So forecasting is still a crystal ball, but you use a computer for it. And you use quantitative models. You're still predicting, but it's a computer crystal ball. It's an apple. It's, it's something else. The crystal ball just looks differently. But you are trying to project what's happening to the future based on what is happening in the past, what has happened in the past. So you're analyzing what's happened, and then you say, based on this and some factors, this is where it's going to go. That's forecasting. Okay. Results may be interpreted qualitatively. Forecasting, I want to forecast what is going to happen around oh, the wonderful thing about, about the Department of Higher Education and the Department of Basic Education. I'm going to forecast what's going to happen if the universities get hold of potential teachers and train the living daylights out of them so they can at least spell. Okay? Okay. <coughs> then I look at that and I predict. But I have to also take into account qualitatively all of this depend that those teachers actually go do teaching jobs. Because if I train them that well, they may go do it other jobs. And the people that end up teaching the kids still can't spell. Still can't spell. So the kids will come in, still can't spell. So it's a, it's a, there's some qualitative elements. So you have to look at varying factors in there. But you can make it purely mathematical. You can use beautiful um, little symbols to describe it. And you don't have to struggle with difficult words. Futures research, Clem Sunday is a good example. You are looking scenarios, you're looking at possible futures. Forecasting is saying that's the way. Maybe this way, maybe that way, but mostly that way. Okay. Futures research is saying this is a possible future and we've got to do this kind of thing. This is a possible future and we've got to do this kind of things. So your techniques there, Delphi, could be something. But it looks ahead. You're not looking at what has happened. Futures research doesn't happen like forecasting. This is what's happened. I know what's happened. I've looked at it. So I'm forecasting this. Futures research say, I'm here. What will happen to the front? Slight difference there. And you're trying to look what experts are saying about the future. You're trying to get evidence what you can link theoretically about what's going to happen. Simulation, if you look at operations research, if you look at industrial engineering, those kind of things, the happier. Okay? Mathematical, you build a simulation. Okay, you could also build physical simulation, but mostly it's about building a mathematical for formula that is approximately what happens in real life. Remember approximately, start here, model it, look what is happening, model it in a different way, look what's happening, and then I say, okay, if my model behaves like that, and my model is a true representation of reality, if I do this, this should happen. It depends on how close the model that you use is to reality. And a lot of simulation is about improving the models that you're using so that what the modeling and the simulation produce is closer to what has actually been observed. So you just want to get closer. Okay. And you're looking at investigating situations. So I want to say, OK, I want to know how should I adjust something to make sure that it comes out differently. Now I can go around and I can do experiments. And if I'm doing experiments in the lab, that's OK with things. Adjust it, check it. Adjust it, check it. But with a model, you want to say, OK, I'm trying to develop a model that tells me, if I adjust it like this, this is going to happen. And then I want to know that that model is close to it. Game or role playing, you're simulating. You're telling people, OK, remember that example that I told you about the Stanford prison experiment? That's a classical role playing. People live themselves into that. Some are the prisoners. 
some of the prison guards, and they got so happy, the prison guards, about beating up the prisoners that they had to stop the experiment. Remember that whole thing. And there's a link on the wiki about that. Simulation, you're trying to work out how people are working. You say you've got to do some research about how leaders act. You are going to say, let's take these roles and we see how they interact and we observe that through the simulation. So you participate in something and you observe it, you measure things, etc. Focus groups. Focus groups is something that people very often use and say, I'm going to use a focus group. But what you're trying to do with a focus group, you are trying to pull people together and let's discuss this issue so we know what factors are really in there. So you want to bring people together and you want to explore issues. Now a focus group shouldn't be too big, nor should it be too small. And most of all, what you want to have in there is people that have something to say that you want to know about at this point. So when you're looking at focus group, you need a moderator. <coughs> you don't want them to just cha 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 You want them to get around to something. So somebody has to be in there to guide the focus group. Sometimes that person has to be a particularly strong-willed person, but not intrusive. They shouldn't say, okay, this is it, because nobody cares what they think. They want to know what the focus group think, but they should also control the focus group to focus on what should be discussed. So your size and composition is it, something your moderator is it. Sometimes it's, this, it's useful, sometimes it's a waste of time. It could be a cheap way. So instead of talking to 20 different people, I get 20 people together and I quickly get to an agreement so instead of having repeated uh, conversations with them. But it also could be quite expensive. If you want to meet the focus group and you've got to cater for them and find a facility for them and look after them and sort of pay them for the time or make it worth their while to sit there and discuss whatever you want to do. Okay. Disadvantages and disadvantages. <coughs> Case study design. Remember there's something different? You want to understand complex phenomena. So you're looking at a unique situation. And what you're trying to do is develop some kind of theory that un enables you to understand or explain. So you're sitting there, and this is my case. So what is your unit of observation? Am I trying to understand about how people are working? Am I trying to understand about how departments are working? Am I trying to understand how businesses are working? So I look at Gauteng, the case of Gauteng. Am I going to look at the people, the businesses, the leaders? What is the unit that I'm actually going to analyze? Because within a case, there's a heck of a lot of things that I can analyze. So it's really, really too important if you do case study research to the design to say, okay, this is my case. My unit of analysis is a department. My unit of analysis is a person. What is my, you've got to just make that decision and explicitly. And you get really deep description and you try and inquire about it. And you can use a number of course, uh, different sources. I want to know about people, so I talk to them, I send some of them questionnaires across this case. I go and look at what they've written. I go and look about the archives around it. There's a lot of that. Detail around that, yin, Y-I-N. Ethnography. Now, ethnographic research is really, really rich and rewarding, but it's very time consuming. So ethnographers say, I want to study and know about students. So in order to know about students, I have to be accepted and part of the students. It's going to be really difficult for me to get, get accepted. I'm a few years older than most of the students. And that is true in ethnography. You want to be forming part of that group. 
So you don't disturb them. You're just sitting there among them, perfectly happy, observing what they're doing. But for people or any group to be comfortable to do what they supposed they normally would have done around you, they have to trust you. And they're not going to do it very quickly. So it takes some time. If you're going to do some ethnographic research, you have to be part of that tribal situation, that grouping, that community that you are trying to, to study. Because you've got to be part of them, you've got to function as part of them, you have to be able to look at what is happening in that social. Ethnography is totally, totally on the opposite side of positivist. It's fully interpretivist because it looks at a specific situation that you fully immerse yourself in. You become part of the situation so you can experience it. So now does it differ from observation and classical theory? Yes. In which essence? Okay. Observation can be strictly positivist. I can go there and say, I don't want to feel what they feel. I want to go look at these indicators. I want to go look what the toilet paper looks like, how much toilet paper they allow per person. I want to go look at certain things. So it can be strictly positivist. It can also go all the way down that you try and understand how they're feeling. But you are not fully observing it from within that context an observation. You use observation, but you're observing as part of that context. You're not separated from the people that you're studying through looking at them, through anything, you're part of them. <coughs> so it's... So it's what about participating when participatory? With them. You're yes. working. So participatory is typically that you're working with people. You may not be part of them. You could be doing participatory action research while you're two researchers at TUT and you're working together to do action research that you both participate in to observe, to get different things out of. Typically, you have the user and you have the facilitating side, but you are part of that, but you are not. So I do participatory action research on designing interventions to get people to understand research the proposal development. Okay? I'm participating in that. On the one side, I have a head of school that wants this to work because he's got this massive amount of honest students that he's got it through. On the other side, here I am, the researcher, a little bit of a consultant, a little bit of a researcher, scholar in this area, enough of a scholar, that they will allow me to form a participative intervention in there. Lots of detail about getting permission. But I'm certainly not a student in the situation. If I'm doing ethnographic research and I want to understand about developing a proposal, I have to become part of that tribe. I have to be sitting among you, chatting to all of you, carrying on pretending sometimes that I'm developing my own proposal to understand what it's about. I cannot do that. For me, it's difficult to understand it because I'm not part of you. You're never going to tell me the truth. I'm never going to understand what this is. I mean, I can look at some of you and I can see that you're sleeping and I can understand that you're working people that also study. I can deal with that. But the rest I don't really understand because I'm not part of you. You're never going to trust me enough to be yourself with me because I'm in a different position. So if I wanted to study that from an ethnographic perspective, I've got to sneak in here and just be part of you. One of you could be an ethnographic researcher in this area. <laughs> okay. And you won't know. That's the real difference. No, no, no. I'm not part of you. <laughs> you know I'm not part of you. Okay. Is that clear? You don't know that the person that is part of you. Okay. You think they're part of you. You've got to learn they're part of you. They're happy. We behave naturally. They are part of this functioning group. This tribe, in this case, would be this student body. I want to understand it. Okay. 
There's a lot of danger involved in ethnographic study. The risk is not only physical, this tribe might put you in a pot and eat you, but it is also that becoming part of that tribe, you start having anxieties. I might be sitting here pretending that I'm also developing my proposal for my doctorate research, and I become so involved in being that that I suddenly start panicking about doing my doctoral research without understanding that I've done it. <laughs> because you become so much part, and there's a lot of emotional risk that you've got to understand. What is it that could happen to you? I can decide, I want to really understand what happens in prisons. Okay? There's physical and emotional danger in that. So that kind of research has, has danger and the ethical issues. So your ethical issues there very often is involved with the researcher themselves the issues that could be of risk there. Scenario research, we've spoken about that. You're looking at what's happening in this scenario, what's happening in this scenario. Similar to the game playing, you're saying, let's put this together, look at it. Let's put it in this way together to look at it. But you are designing those scenarios. You're not looking at case studies to see what's happening. You are deliberately saying, I think this scenario would work and you put these kind of people together to look at them. Or I think maybe this scenario and you put another kind and you analyze it. So it's slightly different from actually looking to what's happening in reality. <coughs> so, summary. The research approach, if I'm using a lab experiment, I am strictly positivist. If I'm using a field experiment that I'm looking to see what's really happening, I could be doing positivist work or I could be doing interpretivist work. If I'm doing participative ob participant observation, I'm doing interpretivist work. Probably not at the very edge of it, but because I'm interpreting, I'm both part, so I feel somewhere. Large-scale survey, it is strictly positivist. I'm trying to observe things. I'm saying that if I measure this, I can predict something else. This construct is measured in that way. If I want to know what your intelligence is, I use this instrument, I put you all down, you fill it out, and I know your intelligence. Okay, that's typically, although I can go around in very other ways around that. In-depth survey, it's mostly interpretivist okay? because you really have to deal with it. You can't just do samples, mostly interpretivist. Case studies can go either side. Role-playing, interpretivist, strictly. Focus group, mostly interpretivist. Scenario research, mostly interpretivist. Action research, strictly interpretivist because you're part of it. Forecasting, strictly positivist. I'm sitting there, I'm looking at the loss, I'm using a lot of statistics and modeling to say where I'm going. Futures research, scope for either. Simulation modeling, strictly positivist. Okay. Now, what you need to do, and some of you are already in a position that you can actually do it. The rest of you have to keep this in mind while you're developing your research sub-question, your research empirical objectives. You want to know what tactic, this last bit, is going to work for you. You've got to choose it. And possibly by knowing which one you're going to choose, some of you, we've been working around that one. It's going to influence the way you phrase your research question the way you phrase your research problem. These are linked. So if you go to the end with this research problem, say, oops, the right way, the coherent way to address it is in a tactical way that I can not do for some reason or another. Then you've got to go back up the line and you've got to say, okay, let me fiddle with this research problem until such time that I can actually do it. 
This is exactly why we make you do this, um, your assignment three to make you think about these things ahead of time. So those of you that are ready to do it, you can go do it in more detail. Those of you that are approaching assignment three, take these things into mind. You want to choose carefully. You want to choose something that suits you and your supervisor agrees. You want, must be able to answer your question with this tactic. There's no point to say, I'm going to do this one. It doesn't answer your question. You've got to align these things. You've got to ensure that your strategy and your tactics align. We've spoken about those. You make sure that you can do it. It's no point. Research is about the art of the possible. You want to get your degree. Full stop. And your supervisor must agree. Now, I can give you guidance as to what I think is suitable. I don't know your, your field that in that much detail. And I'm certainly not in the position of your supervisor. Your supervisor has to approve there. Don't try and be fancy. Sometimes in the beginning you want to have something that is so dramatic, okay? <laughs> you actually have to do it, okay? Don't be fancy. Pick something that you're comfortable with. Really, it's important, okay? You don't want to change the world. You just want to prove that you can get this degree, the one that you're busy with. You don't want to do five masters. You want to do one. So be very careful. Focus. Pick. Pick something that minimizes the practical reality. Something that you can get to the data. Which data have you got? Some that you have that you can get. And this you use to inform your choices. Although we're talking about research design as if it only happens afterwards, it actually informs everything in the process. And most of your assignments have been focused so that you will take certain aspects of this into consideration. You must be able to define research protocol. Now we'll talk about this in much more detail. Don't worry about it. This is next week. Population, data analysis, all of these things. This will be addressed next week. But you have to be able to specify that. So what assignment five is, and you can certainly not do this in detail, but you can start doing with that. For assignment five, you now have to be really, really happy with your problem. You can see that in every single assignment, we ask you to state your problem again, because you start knowing more. If your problem change, your title change. Your title is a reflection of your problem. So by assignment five, we want you to be very certain about this problem because this is what your final research proposal is going to be built around. State your question. If you need to change that question into hypothesis as your primary area, if you're going to do, do mostly positivist work, state that. Structure your research problem. Draw me that little diagram that comes out of assignment three. Decide what's your philosophical choices. Decide what's your methodological choice. Maybe you want to put a flow diagram to talk about that. And then you list your empirical objectives. You start it, you do a table. Objective one, objective two, objective three. And for each of those objectives, you decide. What strategy am I going to follow for this? What techniques? You may be using more than one technique to answer a single question because you want to triangulate and get more than one answer to check if you get the same answer. You want, or if it's different, why it's different. You want to choose your population for every research question. There's a different population. There may be different populations that you, st that you use to answer the same research question. For each method that you're following, you may be using a different population. So state that. How are you going to sample? At this point, you may not quite be clear, but you've got to get around to it. How are you going to collect it? 
what about validity and reliability and what about the ethical consideration? Typically, you have to have in there later what are you going to analyze as well. That is your, um, if you look at assignment five, those are the kind of things that we are going to look at. I'm going to go through this next week again. <coughs> Any other question? You look stunned, dazed, <laughs> tired, exhausted. I can't see anybody here that is not truly half dead. Okay? I know this is a different area. This is an incredibly wide area. This is something that can be a whole year course on its own. Every topic can be a whole year course. We are giving you an overall view, saying, okay, this is approximately what's happening here. Where do you want to go? You only have to know the detail about where you want to go. Discuss this with your supervisor. Read about it. I've just given you an overall framework to engage with. I Any question? You want to go home? <laughs> <laughs> you asked me where I want to go. <laughs> All of you want to go home. Yes. Is there any question you want addressed now while you're staggering around? Or please, by next week, that is by Wednesday morning next week, if there's anything specific you want me to address next week, any of these things that you want more detail about, send it through and we can see what we can fit into that. Okay. You can just email me. Email. If you now sit here and when you start looking back at this, you work out that I need to know a little bit more about this. Request it through to Prof. Barry that I can see if we can fit this in, into our session next week. Or schedule an appointment. There are a few limited opportunities to be terrorized. <laughs> Come and... <laughs> okay, guys, have a lovely... <laughs>